to the biblical view. As we read uh, Hebrews chapter 4, we see here the compassion of our high priest, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. May we continue to stand as we worship. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone. Who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. On him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, walk with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ I'll stand, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Lord, we thank you for saving us, for making us yours, for, Lord, washing away our sin that it no longer has a hold on us, it no longer has dominion over us, Lord, that we have been taken into your kingdom in you. Lord, we praise you for giving us, Lord, a heart that would love righteousness, a heart that would follow after you. You have done everything to make us yours, and we bless you and thank you. Lord, be glorified as we sing. We know you are worthy of praise, and Jesus, we want to offer that up to you this evening. Bless your holy name, Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we continue in worship. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. 
How unsearchable His judgments How untraceable His path Who knows the mind of our God Who can bring counsel to Him Who has given to God That God should repay For from Him everything to God be the glory forever and ever to God be the glory forever amen to God be the glory forever and ever to God be the glory forever amen oh the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God How unsearchable His judgments How untraceable His paths Who knows the mind of our God Who can bring counsel to Him Who has given to God God should repay for from him through him to him is everything to God be the glory forever and ever to God be the glory forever amen to God be the glory forever and ever God be the glory forever, amen. For from Him, through Him, to Him is everything. For from Him, through Him, to Him is everything. God be the glory forever and ever. To God be the glory forever. Amen. To God be the glory forever and ever. To God be the glory forever. Amen. To God be the glory forever and ever. To God be the glory forever. Amen. To God be the glory forever and ever to God be the glory forever Oh, 
It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. greeting right tonight. I've said good morning like three times. <laughs> so I'm going to be uh, leading us in prayer tonight. And um, as you know, we, um, one of our leaders of the church leads us in a corporate prayer every Sunday. And um, we pray for a group of things each, each Sunday. Um, so this Sunday, we are be- going to be praying for our families uh, in the fellowship, our marriages, um, but for the singles and widows in our fellowship, for college age uh, and young adults, um, our youth, and uh, for our children. So as I was praying about how to pray for these groups of people in our congregation, I recognize these are all people, all God's people. And so um, we're going to hit every one of you tonight and pray for you. Uh, each one of us will fall in one of, these, one of these categories, one of these stages of life. And so we would just want to lift you up. Uh, tonight, and so will you uh, join with me as we we pray. Father God, we thank you for the fellowship that you have gathered here together at Calvary Chapel in Turlock, and Lord, we pray for the families that are represented in our body. Lord, we thank you for them. Uh, We thank you um, for the husbands and wives of these families, Lord, and we pray that they would look to you, Lord, in seeking how to raise these children, Lord, and how to determine how many they would have uh, in their family, Lord, whether it be one or many. Father, we pray that uh, their dependence, Lord, and their will would be submitted to you. Lord, we pray for the marriages in our body, Lord. We, your, your word tells us that uh, the man who finds a wife finds a good thing, and it is a good thing, Lord. It's it's a picture of, of our relationship that that we have with you, Lord, uh, as the church is the bride of Christ, Father. And we thank you, Lord, for that picture, that b- just a beautiful picture of the relationship that we can have with our Creator. And Father, we thank you for um, 
those among us, uh, we thank you for Justin Norwood and Ariana who have um, committed to, to marriage, Lord. We pray for them and the, the preparation that they have in the, their marriage in the few months to come, Father. Lord, we thank you for the anniversary celebrations that we've celebrated today with John and Jamie Milani, Lord, and, and my wife and uh, myself, Lord. We thank you for, um, for the longevity of Lord, many marriages uh, in our fellowship, Lord. We uh, pray that you would know marriage in our, our midst, Lord, would there would be any more division, uh, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that uh, each marriage would be s submitted to you, Lord, with uh, as a three-cord cord bind, Lord, with you as the center, binding that marriage, Lord, and keep it intact. Father, we thank you for the newlyweds uh, in our fellowship, the young marrieds, the, uh, those that are middle-aged and those that have married 50-plus years even uh, and more. And Father, for the singles in our fellowship, we pray that you would minister to them and that you would bless them uh, in this season of, of life, Lord, and that those that desire a spouse, Lord, that you, according to your will, Lord, would bring uh, one to them, Lord, that it would be a, a marriage made in you, Lord, and that it would be a, a marriages that would be equally yoked, Lord, with uh, believer with believer. Lord, we pray that um, they would not lose heart, Lord, uh, during this, th that season, Lord, that you would just uh, bless them and use them, Lord, in, in ministry and uh, that they would grow in you, Father. And Father, for those that have lost their their spouses, Lord, we pray that you would minister to them. Um, Lord, you describe your son, Jesus, as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, Lord. And, and we experience that here, Lord, on this earth, and uh, particularly those that have been married and lost a spouse, Lord. We pray that you would just minister to them that you would carry them through the rest of this life that you have for them on this earth, Lord, and that you would provide all their needs, Lord, emotionally and spiritually and financially, and, Lord, that the church would minister to them as well. Father, for our college age, we thank you, Lord, that for those that continue to serve you in the midst of a a wicked and perverse generation. Lord, I pray that you would just give them strength and time in your word, but that they would remain in fellowship with you, Lord. And, and Lord, I pray that they would also have your view of sin and of the world and be fervent in their desire to follow you and to follow the, your call that you have upon their lives. Lord, for our high school youth, we, Lord, we pray that their faith in you would be solidified at this time in their lives that they commit to you and that they would be determined to follow you all the days of their life father we pray that you would use the high school and college ministry that we have here lord to to equip them and to bless them and to help them grow uh, in in their relationships with one another and their relationship with you and father we pray for our children that your word would be sown into their lives uh, daily, Lord, by their parents, uh, that they would learn to, to sow your word into their, their lives at a young age, Father, that they would desire your word and what you say uh, about life, Lord. We pray for, for Sundays, Lord, um, as they come to church and they're ministered to by the children's ministry workers, Lord, we pray that, that lives would be saved in those rooms, Father, and seeds would be planted. Lord, protect them from this world. May they grow up to know the spiritual safety that they have in the relationship with you. Father, so we lift up all of these people, Lord. These are your, your people. Lord, may you pour your love and your grace upon them. Everything that is of you, Lord, we pray upon the, the body of Calvary Chapel Turlock. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Dan. Good evening to everyone. We're going to finish out 2 Samuel tonight. Can you believe it? We're just marching through the Bible. Always look at Miss Verna, Miss Dorothy. We're going to make it all the way through. We're just getting faster and faster as we go. But uh, wonderful. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 24. 2 Samuel chapter 24. And let's
let's go to the Lord and ask His blessing upon the teaching of the Word this evening. Lord, we come before You thankful for Your Word, and we ask, Lord, that You would speak to us as You are so faithful to do through Your Word, and that You would conform us into Your image, Lord, even as Dan prayed that um, for our youth, that they would stand strong against the culture and against the world that is trying to pull them away. Lord, we know the antidote to that. We know that Your Word and your word applied rightly to our hearts, Lord, is, is what gives us that, that understanding and what gives us that ability to see the world like you do, Lord. And we know, of course, we live by your spirit, by the power of your spirit inside of us. And we ask your blessing upon this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, verse 1. Again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. Okay, we're going to run into some very hard things to understand theologically here. This is going to be difficult, but I think a safe guide when you run into something hard to understand in Scripture or just hard to understand in life and what you're going through is that you hold on to what you know in the Word of God. Hold on to the obvious things in the Word of God. One well-known pastor likes to say, and I like it very much, the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. So don't lose hold of those things. In other words, when you run into something difficult, either in Scripture or just in life, don't trade in what you know about God for what you don't know about God. And so many people do that, don't they? They build a lifetime of theology, they hit one speed bump, one obstacle, and they throw out the whole thing, and then they wonder, does God really love me? Don't trade in what you know about God for what you don't know about God, okay? Someone has said it this way, and I like it, it's kind of clever, believe your beliefs and doubt your doubts, because doubt is going to come. The enemy loves to bring doubt into our lives, doubt those doubts, and hold on to what you know is true. Too many Christians, when they run into something very hard, something in Scripture, something in theology or doctrine, or in practical life, it is too easy for them to abandon what they know and what they've been taught. So stand fast. By the power of the Holy Spirit, stand firmly on what you know. And then we can work through the confusing parts. One pastor that I, Chuck Smith, that I love to listen to, he said he had a file of we'll find out later basically a file that he would file things that he doesn't understand and says all right i'll find out later about that the lord will reveal it later i I don't quite know how to deal with that we all need to have that kind of file and it doesn't need to get away in the way of what we know to be true so let's walk very carefully here okay through these verses first of all we read that the lord was aroused against israel okay we cannot say what the issue was for sure But like we see all through the book of Judges and in the Old Testament, and we've seen in 1st and 2nd Samuel, it probably has something to do with idolatry, something to do with false worship. We're not told the specifics here. But that was the constant temptation and struggle of Israel in the Old Testament. And that was constantly why God was judging His people, because they continued to fall into idolatry. God would bless them richly. God would just pour His goodness out upon them. And then they would become successful. They would have plenty of grain and food. And they would begin to enjoy their free time and their their leisure. And then they would start to get involved in idolatry. They would start to turn away from the Lord. They would start to indulge their own desires and their own lusts. And then God would punish the nation. He would judge them. Now, to be fair, it doesn't say that specifically here. It doesn't say that it's idolatry. But I think it's a pretty good speculation That's why the Lord is angry with Israel, because idolatry was the perennial problem of the nation. Now, it is highly likely that after David had defeated the enemies of Israel, that the people started to relax. Remember, he's conquered everyone. The Philistines have been put down, the Moabites. I mean, just everyone has been been set aside now. They've kind of come under David's authority and rule. And so Israel is enjoying this great time of peace. And it may be that they've gotten a little comfortable with themselves. It may be that they've started to enjoy their success. They've let their guard down, and now the practices of the pagan culture have come in. We are simply told that God was angry with the nation of Israel. And that sets the stage for the rest of what we're about to read in this chapter. And then we are told 
that he, the Lord, moved David against them to number Israel and Judah. Okay, now just to keep things nice and confusing, we are told in 1 Chronicles 21.1 about this same instance, and it says this, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. You know, that's interesting, isn't it? That's very interesting. It'll be very confusing. So 1 Samuel, or 2 Samuel here, attributes the motivation of numbering here to God. 1 Chronicles says, no, the numbering was from Satan, and Satan moved upon David. And you look at that and you think, what a contrast between the two. And which is it? <laughs> you can't mix those up. Did God move on David's heart? Or did Satan move on David's heart? Now, here's how I think we should see this. At least this is how I see this. 2 Samuel is speaking generally, and 1 Samuel is speaking specifically. In other words, yes, the Lord is involved here because the Lord is in control of all and everything must pass through His hands. Nothing can get to us that does not first pass through the hands of our Father in heaven. God does allow evil things to happen in this world. He even allows evil things to happen to us. He allows bad things to come our way. So in a way, in a general sense, you can say that the responsibility is God's in that it does pass through His hand. Just as God gave permission to Satan to persecute Job, right? Satan had to come to Job. Uh, let's get this right. Satan had to come to God to persecute Job. And the Lord did indeed give his permission for that. So there is a hedge around the believer. There is a hedge of protection, and that hedge cannot be broken or penetrated without the Lord's permission. But we see in the instance of Job that God was not the particular agent of evil Satan was. Okay, it's important to remember that. God was not the particular agent of evil. Satan was. But when we get down to the nuts and the bolts of who was really at work here, it is Satan himself. And that's why I think First Chronicles says that Satan moved upon David to tempt him toward this evil act. So the Lord does allow Satan to tempt even his children. The Lord even allowed Satan to tempt his own son in the wilderness of Judea. Now Jesus did not give in to the temptation, but David does. David does give in to the temptation here. And so I firmly believe that Satan is the, is the one at work here. He is the particular agent of evil, but that he had to first go to the Lord and get permission for this. And that's why the writer of 2 Samuel says here that God allowed this or that God moved on David's heart. And I think, once again, the book of Job is very helpful in divining these things for us to understand this dynamic. Now, basically, you can look at it this way. The child of God has that hedge of protection on his life. And Satan cannot break through that hedge unless the Lord gives permission to do so. We read here that the Lord was angry with Israel, perhaps angry with David himself, for allowing sin to come into the camp, for allowing sin to come into the nation and not handling it. Remember, David was troubled at this time in his life. He had all the problems with Absalom, the things that were going on in his family, and perhaps he was not addressing sin in the nation. And so God allows Satan to come to David and to tempt him. But David, by his own evil heart and his own evil desires, he yields to the temptation. Jesus never did yield to temptation, but David does. We all do. David is not a puppet here. David yields to temptation because of his own heart, and David has personal responsibility. Now, once again, we have another passage to help us out. Just like Job helps us, we also go to the book of James in the New Testament, and this helps us understand some of these things. James says in James 1.12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now that's pretty clear, right? That's pretty foundational. That's pretty 
a pretty strong definition and you can hang on to that you can say all right james gives us a very strong and concrete definition the main things are the plain things the plain things are the main things and when you run into difficulty of a passage like we have here in second samuel you can go to james or you can go to these other foundational passages to help us understand God is not tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone with evil. God cannot sin or be part of sin. When men and women are drawn away, they are drawn away by their, their own evil heart and their own evil desires, and they look at that temptation and say, yeah, that's what I want, and they go through with it. But remember, the Bible also tells us that God always provides a way of escape. We fall into temptation we don't, when we don't take his way of escape. So the responsibility is on us. So David here is drawn away by his own desire, his own pride, in falling for this temptation. All right? Hard passage. And that was just one verse. Verse 2. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Now go throughout all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and count the people that I may know the number of the people. <clears throat> the king was not supposed to number the people he was not supposed to count the people now the lord did command at times for israel to take a census of the people that's the book of numbers remember when they first came out of egypt and then when they first came into the land and their numbers kind of stayed the same after 40 years of wandering that census was commanded by the lord the lord has the right to do that but he did not want the kings to do that because he did not want them to stoke their own pride he did not want them to trust the numbers of the people for their strength. They were not to trust in chariots or horses. They were to trust in the Lord. The Lord did not want to give an order to a king, either in, in advancing against the enemy or defending against an enemy, and the king to say, well, how many soldiers do I have? No, just trust the Lord. Do what the Lord says, no matter what the size of your army is. It was just like with Gideon and the Midianites, remember? Gideon started with, with over 30,000, still a, a small number compared to the Midianites that were coming into the land. He was probably thinking, oh man, I'm greatly outnumbered. And then the Lord said, send away all of those who are afraid. What? Lord, what do you mean? We're going into battle. Everyone's afraid. And then he lost, you know, two-thirds of the army. Now he's down to 10,000. He's thinking, okay, well, the Lord can probably still work through 10,000. And the Lord says, you still have too many, Gideon. Have them go and drink. And then those that drink this way, you know, that bring the water up to themselves, set them aside. He was down to 300. Can you imagine Gideon? <laughs> 300 people, Lord. And the Lord said, that's about the right number. I can use 300 to defeat the Midianites. But do not trust in the greater number. And that's kind of what the deal is here. By a king counting and taking an assessment of his kingdom and how big it is, it feeds his own pride. And so David is commanding this census from pride. Verse 3. And Joab said to the king, Now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times more than they are. And may the eyes of the Lord the king see it. But why does my Lord the king desire this thing? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the army. Therefore Joab and the captains of the army went out from the presence of the king to count the people of Israel. So Joab, for all of his wickedness and all of his failures, we've seen Joab mess up many times so far and do things in direct disobedience to the Lord. But here Joab is a voice of righteousness. Joab actually comes to David and says, David, don't do this thing. May the Lord bless you a hundred times. May he increase the kingdom 100 fold. But don't go and count the people. Don't do this evil. And yet David will not listen. David persists, even against wise counsel. David, again, is listening to his own pride. Even when someone like Joab tries to stop him, you would think that David would say, okay, if Joab is protesting this act, maybe I should listen. But he doesn't. He's being drawn away by his own desires, just as James said. Verse 5. And they crossed over the Jordan and camped in Aurora, on the right side of the town, which is in the midst of the ravine of Gad, and toward Jazer. Then they came to Gilead, and to the land of Tatim, Hadshi. They came to Dan Ya'an, and around to Sidon. And they came to the stronghold of Tyre, and to all the cities of the Hivites and the Canaanites. Then they went out to the south, 
uh, went out to south Judah as far as Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. Then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to the king. And there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword. And the men of Judah were 500,000 men. Okay, so this is quite a journey. And for those of you that have been to Israel, you can kind of picture this in your mind, how they cover the whole country, how they've got to cross the Jordan and go down across the Jordan Valley and then up into the hills on the other side. And they go to all of the cities in Israel and they make this count. So they're covering a lot of terrain, they're going through the wilderness. I mean, they're just they're hitting it all. That's why it takes them over nine months to do this. But as they travel throughout the nation, they count a combined 1.3 million valiant men, meaning men that could serve in the military, men that could swing a sword and fight. So 1.3 million. Well, that means that there are at least as many women, probably more women, that have not been killed in battle. So uh, we can at least double that. So now you're looking at 2.6 million people that are in the age of the military. And then, of course, you have teens and you have children and then you have the elderly that could not serve. So I would guess when looking at this, my own figure would be about 4 to 5 million people in Israel. Today, there are about 8 million people in Israel. So a pretty big size without the technology that we have today. And so a lot of people living in the land during the time of David. Verse 10, and David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done, but now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. So some time goes by, and then David is convicted in his own heart. Lord, I've sinned. I've sinned against you. I should not have done this thing. I should not have counted the people. He knows now that he's acted out of pride. He knows that he was measuring his own kingdom and his own success. And he says, Lord, please forgive me. I have done wrong against you. He confesses his sin. Now, I do believe this is why the Lord continually shows David such great mercy. Because he sins, but he confesses his sin. He repents. He turns away from it. Verse 11. Now when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, and he said to him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or shall you flee three months before your enemies, while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days' plague in your land? Now consider and see what answer I should take back to him who sent me. So now we learn of this prophet by the name of Gad, and he comes to David and he tells him, you know what, the Lord is very upset with your sin. The Lord is upset with Israel. And, and, and basically what we're seeing here is that there are consequences to sin. The Lord can forgive us, and he does forgive us. But so often there are consequences to sin, and that's what we're seeing here. But remember, the Lord is using all of this to chastise, to punish Israel for their sin. Once again, we're not told what that sin is. But I believe that it's something to do with idolatry. It's something to do with, with walking away from the Lord. And so the Lord is using this to stop Israel in their tracks. Don't go down this path any longer. So Gad offers him three choices, basically, from the Lord. He says, do you want seven years of famine... Do you want three months of defeat from your enemies? Well, they will come into the land and you'll be on the run. Or do you want three days of plague directly from God? Three days of plague from the Lord. Verse 14. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning till the appointed time from dan to beersheba seventy thousand men of the people died and when the angel stretched out his hand over jerusalem to destroy it the lord relented from the destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people it is enough now restrain your hand and the angel of the lord was by the threshing floor of aruna the jebusite so wisely david says i'll take the three days of plague I'll take the three days of plague from the Lord because I know the Lord is merciful. Don't let me fall into the hands of man. Man is very cruel. He is merciless. He is 
He is a, an avenger of, of hatred and wickedness. I don't want to fall into the punishment or the judgment of man. I will put myself into the hand of God. So he effectively chooses three days of plague. So the Lord sent a plague upon the entire nation, and it killed 70,000. But the Lord stayed the hand of the angel as he was about to judge the city of Jerusalem. We don't know what this is, but the angel was there, and he was ready to cast his judging hand over Israel, and the Lord stopped him right there. In his mercy, he said, enough. So we see here the mercy of God, even in the midst of judgment. I hope that's something that you've seen so far as we've been going through the Bible, as we covered the book of Judges, as we've been in 1st and 2nd Samuel. We've seen often God's judgment, but what have we also seen? We've seen the mercy of God, haven't we? Even in the midst of judgment, we've seen the great mercy of God. The main things are the plain things. Don't let go of that one. Don't ever doubt for one second the mercy and the goodness of God. Even in the midst of judgment, as we've been talking about on Sunday mornings in Revelation, even though God sends these great punishments upon the earth, how he sends his people to go and call out for people to repent, how he sends his own, how he, he marks his own to go and, and, and just preach the gospel and to speak the good news to people so that they might turn away from their sin and receive his goodness. And so the Lord here is good. He is kind. He is merciful, even in the midst of judgment. But notice, the angel is there on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Now this is on Mount Moriah, the very place where the Temple Mount stands today. The same place that Abraham offered his son Isaac as a sacrifice. When you see a picture of Israel, when you see a picture of Jerusalem specifically, it's almost always that picture of the Temple Mount where the two mosques are, the Dome of the Rock Mosque, the one with the Golden Dome, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, those two mosques there. Well, there were, at one time there was a temple there and, and no mosque. That's called the Temple Mount. Well, that Temple Mount is on Mount Moriah. And a lot of things happen on Mount Moriah. Abraham offered his son Isaac there. And now we see this threshing floor of Arun and the Jebusite at that same place. And then the temple would be built there. And then Jesus would also be crucified there. All on Mount Moriah. Verse 17. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Surely I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep... What have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. Now, once again, this is why we love David and why David is so special to us. What a humble man overall. Yes, he sinned in a moment of pride, but he humbles himself, he confesses his sin, he repents, and he says, Lord, let the punishment fall on me and not on the people. Reminds us of the Apostle Paul, doesn't it? The Apostle Paul says, oh, I would be accursed if Israel could be saved. Just such a great love for his brethren. But David and Paul could not take the sin of the people. There's another that came and said, Father, let the sin of these people fall on me that they might be forgiven. And he could take the sin, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. He did it. And so once again, we see that David is a beautiful picture of Jesus. So David prays to the Lord, Lord, send this punishment to me. Verse 18. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David, according to the word of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. So David is commanded here by the Lord to build an altar to sacrifice to the Lord on Mount Moriah there on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. As I said, don't miss this. Mount Moriah, the same place where Isaac was offered by Abraham, his father, to the Lord. The same place where the temple is going to be built, there at the threshing floor of Aruna. And the same place where Jesus would be crucified. All happening there. Abraham offered his son Isaac, but the father stopped him from offering his son. He kept his hand. And yet the father would give his own son, Jesus, on Mount Moriah, the same mountain. But he would not stay his hand. He would go through with the sacrifice, and Jesus would die for us. It all happened there. Verse 20. Now Aruna looked and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So Aruna went out and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Then Aruna said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? 
And David said, To buy the threshing floor from you, to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. So Aruna, the Jebusite, sees David coming. And you know, a king doesn't travel alone. He's got his whole entourage with him. All of the royal you know, entourage traveling with him, coming to his, his place there on Mount Moriah, coming to the threshing floor. And Aruna says, uh, Hey, what can I do for you, king? Now remember, a threshing floor is simply a flat place where they would thresh the wheat. And so they would, they would break it up. Either an animal would walk on it or they would roll a stone on it and they would crack the chaff. And then you take the wheat and you throw it up and then the wind will blow and the wheat will come down because it's heavier and the chaff will blow away. And you continue to do that and you purified your wheat. So that's what a threshing floor is. And so Aruna, the Jebusite, sees the king coming and says, okay, what, what can I do for you, king? And David says, I want to buy your threshing floor from you. Now, as a side note, this is very important. David does not take the threshing floor. He does not take it. He offers to buy it. This is very important to your worldview. Young people especially, listen to me on this. This is very important to you. He offers to buy the threshing floor. He does not take it. The Bible always respects private property. Always. David didn't come and say, okay, this is the law of eminent domain. I'm taking your threshing floor. This one is mine. It belongs to me now. You know, in the Bible, all through Scripture, the Lord commands that your property, my property, everything that we own, our home, you know, our wives, our children, our possessions, just everything that we have, it is sacred and it is to be respected. It is to be honored by one another. The Bible always defends private ownership. It, def it defends the rights to own and keep property. And the Lord tells us to respect these things. This is biblical. Now I say that because of what's happening in our culture today. For those of you that follow the news. You know that Marxism is on the rise. And it's just gobbling up our youth. And it's gobbling up Christian youth. This is hard to believe, but it's happening. I've seen these recent polls about socialism. And young people are saying over 50%, yes, we prefer socialism to capitalism or a free market or private ownership. We believe in a socialistic system. And it's creeping right into the church. I say that because Marxist thinking is encroaching everywhere now. Now, Marx teaches that the state is responsible to take the means of production, to take capital away from people and to distribute it equally to all and today the youth are hearing that and they're saying well that sounds good yeah there are rich people and poor people the state should come in and take and distribute equally and that's very loving that's like jesus no it's not that is not biblical that is not what the bible teaches many young christians are looking at this and they're saying yeah i think that's a very good system no god honors private property he honors private ownership he gives us property rights and these things are sacred they are to be protected and guarded if anyone had the right to take the land it would be david right david had the right here to say okay look i'm the king the nation is being plagued right now Seventy thousand people are dying aruna i'm confiscating your land you give it to me but he doesn't do it even in the height of the emergency he comes to aruna the jebusite and says let me buy your land let me purchase your land because it is your land and i am offering you just and fair compensation for it in fact if i know david here he's probably given even more i'll give you double what this thing is worth this is important to understand the bible does not teach marxism marx teaches marxism but not the bible verse 22 now aruna said to david let my lord the king take and offer up whatever seems good to him Look, here are oxen for burnt sacrifice, and threshing implements, and the yokes of the oxen for wood. All these, O king, Aruna has given to the king. And Aruna said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. Now, Aruna, what a guy. He doesn't know what's happening here. He just sees David. David wants to sacrifice to the Lord. The nation is in the midst of trouble. He says, Here you go. Whatever you want. Aruna the Jebusite has a right heart before the Lord, even though he's a Gentile, right? He's a Jebusite. The people that owned Jerusalem before David conquered it. I mean, this guy could have been very bitter, right? He could have said, hey, 
the Jebusite land. This is, this is our land. You came in and conquered us. He doesn't. He says, whatever you want, David, I give it to you. He obviously sees and understands true worship. He understands the true and the living God. And I think Aruna's heart is right before the Lord. And so he just offers up everything to David. Take my threshing floor, take my oxen, take my wood. Whatever you need, it's all yours, David. So what a great heart. What a willing spirit. It's probably why the Lord blesses Aruna so much. Verse 24, Then the king said to Aruna, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. So David brought, bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. Okay, what we have in these last two verses are absolutely foundational to the Christian life. Take these verses, underline them, circle them, put a star, mark it in your mind, however you do it in your Bible. These two verses are foundational. They are a key, if you will, to the Christian life and Christian service. They are a key to our doctrine and our theology. David is offered a free gift by Aruna the Jebusite here for the sacrifice, but David won't take it. Aruna has a right heart. Aruna is being very generous to the Lord, but David knows that sacrifice must cost him something and not Aruna. David could have said, yeah, great, all right, you give the cattle, you give the wood, you give the land, and I'll sacrifice to the Lord. But that would not have been David's sacrifice. That would have been Aruna's sacrifice. David knows that if he's going to sacrifice to the Lord, it's got to cost him something. He must sacrifice before the Lord. David knows that it personally has to cost him something. Now, here's the point. Sacrifice, sacrificial service, is always costly. It will always cost you something. It may cost you your time. It may cost you your talent. It may cost you your treasure. I don't speak about it unless it comes up in the Word of God. I've never given a sermon on why you should give. If I see it in the Word, I'll talk about it. I'm not afraid to talk about money, nor do I shy away from it. But here it is. Sacrifice has to cost you something. Your time, your talent, your treasure, your comfort, your sleep, your vacation plans, your leisure, your hobbies, your relationships, your entertainment, your me time, whatever it is, if you are going to serve the Lord effectively, it must be sacrificial and it must cost you something just like true love true love must cost you something how many husbands would impress their wives if they said honey will you marry me but uh, don't expect anything from me uh you run your life and i'll run my life but uh i'm not giving you any money any time anything i'm just you know i'll just come to you when i need you but i'm not giving you anything any wife in her right mind would say uh we're not going to have that kind of marriage that's not sacrificial love true love is sacrificial True service to the Lord, the true love to the Lord that we have for Him is, by nature, sacrificial. It must cost us something. If we are serving the Lord out of our convenience, and there's no cost, then it's not genuine service to the Lord. We are called to be living sacrifices, and the Bible is clear on that. And I know I'm talking to a Sunday night crowd. I know that, by and large, you're very sacrificial in your lives, and that's wonderful. But it's something that we need a reminder of. It's something that we need to just sit before the Lord and say, Lord, am I serving you in a sacrificial way? Is, is it costing me something to live for you? It means that when we serve the Lord, we are to serve the Lord as a living sacrifice. We know that. Paul makes it clear to the Romans in the New Testament. We are to be living sacrifices. And so it has to cost us something in every facet of life. Now, just to make sure that our young people are not confused here, okay? We do not sacrifice to gain something from God. Jesus paid the price for our salvation, right? He sacrificed his own life so that we might be saved. So we don't sacrifice to gain something from God. We live the Christian life as an act of gratitude to say, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. 
and we present ourselves to the Lord as an act of sacrifice, as a self-sacrifice. And so basically we are saying when we sacrifice ourselves, Lord, I'm not a part of this world. Lord, I'm not following the culture. I'm not living my life in a way that it's all about me. I want to live a holy life unto you. And so the Christian life, it has to cost us something, not to gain something from the Lord, not to gain salvation. That was already given to us. That's a free gift. But to say, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for me. This is what pleases the Lord. And for those ministries today that teach, and there are many of them, that you can have your best life now, that you can get everything that you want from, from God. Pastor Dan just showed me a video today. We were talking about false prophets, and he called up this video. And uh, there's, a, there's a teacher out there, um, just horrible, just horrible things that he was saying. And has a mega, mega church, and has his own jet and his own runway. Okay, that part was really neat. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes, I know you're going to give you a hard time on that. <clears throat> But uh, this guy was literally saying to his congregation, money, money cometh to me. He was saying that. And he was telling the people that they are gods and that they say the right words and they will get rich. And basically it's, if you send me the money, then you will get rich. No, it was working really well for him, but not so much for the people. It's just corrupt. It's just corrupt. And it's going on today. These are false teachers. I'm going to tell you just the opposite. I'm going to tell you that the Christian life is going to cost you something. The Lord does bless. I, I'm not going to deny that at all. We serve a blessing God, just like we see with David and all through his life. The Lord loves to bless his people. But the Christian life is costly. The Christian life is sacrificial. David understands that fact. And that's why he will not receive this free gift from Aruna. He says, no, I've got to buy it for you. And as I said, he probably pays double the price. He says, you know what? I'm going to buy it from you. I'm going to buy your oxen. I'm going to buy your wood. Everything will be purchased so that it costs me that I might sacrifice to the Lord. And notice that the Lord hears the prayer of David and he honors the sacrifice and he withdraws the plague. Very good. Very good.